guest today on the first time storytelling broadcast is Tammy Belt. Tammy wanted to be a rock star when she grew up, but couldn't sing on key. So instead, she sings the praises of others in her PR firm. She is an author, speaker, a fan of jazz, classic rock, and nice people. I love that. She's here to share the story of the first time she played in a PGA golf tournament. Welcome to the first time storytelling broadcast, Tammy. Thank you so much, and I am honored to be here. I love stories. I tell them for a living, and I am honored to be able to share my story with you and your audience today. Fabulous, and I cannot wait to hear more about it. Now, you mentioned that you grew your dad was a golf instructor, so you grew up around golf. So tell us, let's, let's start there. <laughs> Yes, my dad was a PGA teaching pro. He taught here in Las Vegas for over 45 years. He taught at Muni. So I literally grew up on the golf course um, way before golf was cool. And most women, and especially not young girls, played golf. So I'd get teased a lot. Um, and I didn't care. I was kind of like a tomboy. I played golf barefoot because you could play barefoot back then. And you can feel your swing better, a half finger glove. You can feel it on your on your fingertips. And I just, um, it, it kind of came naturally and I so, would men and it was fun. <laughs> how, how old are you when you're, when you pick, when you held your first golf club and when you got your first set of golf clubs? Oh my gosh. The first set was shared between me, my brother and sister, and it was cut off golf clubs. It was, you know, adult golf clubs that, that they cut. <laughs> just well, they, the they top for kids. Yeah, shortened it and put the grip, you know, um, cause there was three of us. We weren't each going to have our own set. You don't, a teaching pro doesn't make like tons of money. Yeah. And, um, but dad had played in some tournaments and in some PGA tournaments and sectionals and, you know, um, but so that was like the first set since I could walk. I mean, I don't remember. We just, we always went, if we, if we wanted to see my dad, we went to the golf course. He didn't get Christmas off. He didn't get my birthday off. He didn't get holidays off. His day off was Monday. Mm. Monday. So we would go see him at the golf course a lot and, um, you know, hit balls by where he was giving lessons and he'd yell things out like slow down or take it back shorter. Or, you know, I never got an actual lesson spot with him until I was 30, but, um, Oh my goodness. And a municipal golf course, everybody from CEOs to casino execs to construction workers, to mobsters. My dad caddied for Meyer Lansky. Um, my mom babysat for ice pick Willie. I mean, it's just when you've been in Vegas that long, you just have those stories. So it was just this. Oh, just this collection of people. Yeah. yeah. And the, and the thing is, is all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic, everything, but golf is called the gentleman's game for a reason. And you play, you literally play by the rules and you're kinder and you're, you know, you don't, you don't walk in people's lines. You, you're quiet when they, they swing, you know, they might be gambling and having side bets and this and that, but, but they're respectful. And I didn't know it, but I learned a lot of lessons about life and business and how to conduct yourself from growing up playing golf, even though it wasn't cool. And I got teased a lot, but it was fun hitting the ball. So why, why do you think it wasn't cool in your tease for playing? Well, because golf was for old people back then. I mean, come on, I was born in 65. So playing all through the seventies and eighties, you know, junior high, high school, I lettered on the golf team for four years. Um, yeah, it just, yeah. it was <laughs> It wasn't, I have to admit that my best friend joined the golf team in high school. And I was like, what is <laughs> why you you, yeah, what are you playing golf for? What the yeah. heck? And exactly. I have to admit, I had the same mindset. It's a old man's game. Yeah. And why would you want to play it? And then when I played the first time, I was like, well, this is a lot harder <laughs> than I thought. Harder. And, it's it's yeah, harder than you think. It takes a lot of skills and technique and patience. I like patience. Absolutely. 
So, yeah. So when did you start taking it seriously? Did you always take it seriously or did you at one point realize, huh, I'm pretty good at this. Maybe I, I could do something with it. Well, I'd always play in junior golf tournaments, the Southern Nevada Junior Golf Association. So since I was like 10 or 11, that was when it started. And I even got to play in junior world. I think it was, I was 10, 11 years old, um, where kids from all over the world play in this tournament at San, in San Diego. And uh, I choked, I did really, really bad. The, I, I don't know why, because I'd played in tournaments before, but whatever. I mean, sometimes you're just, you're off. So there you go. And um, so I grew up playing in junior tournaments. And then I, you know, in ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th grade, I, I lettered all four years in high school and it was fun. You know, it's a stress release to, you can put a face on the ball if you're mad at somebody and smack it and you don't get in trouble for hurting anybody. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as I got to, out of college, I didn't play much in college because I was working full-time playing um, working full time, going to school full time, but um, I could I could always hold my own. I, I was, you know, and I, and I wouldn't play all year, all year round, and I would still hold my own, you know, in tournaments or scrambles and different things. And um, I, it was a great great networking when I started working, but I never wanted to try out for the LPGA tour. Lord knows if I would have made it, but I never wanted that. I wanted. I always wanted to play with the big boys. I always wanted to play with the boys because that's what I, I was, that's what I wanted to do. And when I was a kid growing up, we'd always have the, it was the Panasonic, then it was the Las Vegas Invitational. Now it's Shriners, the PGA tournament here. And I would beg my grandpa because the entry fee for the Pro-Am was like, fourth that I don't even remember it was several thousand dollars back then I'm like grandpa please 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 I want to play with the big boys I want to play with the big boys and he just go that's nice I hope you get to one day you know it's like okay and um then I was actually working at the review journal which was weird because I went from sending press releases to the media to working for the media. But one of my responsibilities there was the community engagement portion. We were a major sponsor of the Las Vegas Invitational at the time and the year was 1997. Well, as part of the sponsorship, four of our, we got four pro-am spots. So we would gift our major advertisers, you know, a spot in the pro-am. Well, the day before, one of the advertisers pulled out. I got to play one day. My boss played one day and then another person played on the third day. We split it up for, for three people. That was my dream come true. Oh, I got wow. to play with the big, oh man, that was my dream come true. So let's talk about that day then. What was it like? <sighs> Did you sleep the night before and what was it like to show up at the course and be part of it uh, well thank goodness I, I played at the las vegas country club so i knew that course because i played it growing up in junior tournaments um I, I was a little bit nervous but i was like you know what i've done this before i can you know i can i can hold my own that was all i wanted to be able to do was hold my own so i wanted my dad there i wanted him to caddy for me and he goes nope can't take off Ah, the, oh, well, that's a whole nother story. So he wasn't there. Um, a, a girlfriend of mine, I said, then you caddy for me because you know how dad teaches me. And she's like, I can't. She worked at the hospital I used to work at and there was no way she was a nurse. She couldn't take off from the cardiac cath lab. So I was like, okay, fine. I'm just going to do this. You know, so I get there and I eat breakfast and it's time to meet the team and tee off. Well, the pro and the two other amateurs were back at the men's tee and I get to tee off from the forward tees, the ladies tees. So they didn't come and introduce themselves. And I'm just like, whatever, I'm good. They, the, the caddy came up and introduced himself though, the pros caddy. And he went back to the group and I could hear him say, if she knows how to hit those clubs, she knows what she's doing. And the golf clubs I had 
were from when I graduated high school in 83. They're Wilson staff blades. Blades are really thin, a really, really small sweet spot. But that was what I grew up playing. That was what I liked. I didn't like the bigger, fatter clubs. You know, you can buy a better game. I couldn't hit those because I wasn't used to it. So I heard the guy, the caddy say that. And I'm just like, hmm, I'm going to show them. You know, so they all teed off. I teed off, hit a long drive, but it went into the bunker, the fairway bunker, which is no big deal because you can hit a wood out of a fairway bunker and it just flies, right? So the first hole is a par four. So I get on in two. They still take my shot because the amateurs play a scramble or best ball. And um, I sunk the putt. And I'm not the best putter. <laughs> I can hit it far, but I'm not the best putter. So that was like, wow. And um, I got us a birdie, which because of the way that the handicaps work, got us an eagle on the first hole. So they were like, okay, you know, and almost all the holes after that, I was out driving everybody except of course the pro. Cause that's just, yeah. yeah. Men and women don't have the same strength. They don't, you know, and then all of a sudden, I had a gallery. My mom and my grandma and my aunt came. And because I worked at the newspaper, we had our photographer would come out and take photos of the, you know, our players. And I was actually his supervisor, which was crazy because I didn't need to supervise. He, he, he was a very good photographer and he knew what he was doing. So he was following us around. So I, we're on the first day of a pro-am and the pro, I, I believe it was his first year he wasn't famous. His name was Jack O'Keefe. I don't think he's still in, on the PGA tour. I'm not sure. So it's the first day of the pro-am. So there's not many crowds and it wasn't a known player. And I'm the one with the gallery. And these people are like, who is she? And throughout the whole round, I'm playing these shots that I was just taught to play. I don't think anything of them. And the pro's caddy is like, what are you doing? I said, well, he goes, I don't see half the people on the tour hit the, and it wasn't like trick shots. It was like, I don't see them, you know, hitting these kind of shots and you just like, it's second nature to you. And I'm like, well, that's just how I was taught to play. He goes, what do you do? And why are you doing that and not playing? And I said, well, cause I don't want to go on tour. And I don't think that I was really good enough, but oh, what a day. It was an amazing I, day. I, yeah. And, yeah. And, and grandpa had already passed, so he didn't get to see me play, but grandma did. And that to me was just. So you ended up doing the whole thing. Nobody was caddying with you and you kind of, it had a, a bit of a rough start, it sounds like, but then turned yeah. out into an incredible day afterwards where you got your moment to shine and to raise to what you'd always dreamed of. That's oh, so incredible. I never stopped shaking the whole time. I was just like, my, I, I, oh, I, I was used to playing in tournaments and competitions and stuff, but a whole nother level. Yeah. And when you play in a PGA tournament, the, the greens, they're cut so thin. It's like putting on glass. So if it doesn't go in, you're just like, oh, please, please, please don't go too far because it was like putting on glass. It was just, it was amazing. And we were 18 under that day. Wow. Yeah. We were eight. Yeah, we, we did okay. That's we impressive. Did okay. And, yeah. You know, it, it, it totally was not all me. I mean, it was the team, but yeah, I, I, I contributed. Oh. <laughs> I, pulled, I pulled my weight. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, my, so my first golf scramble was similar and it was with fellow Marines and, you, oh. you know, they went for the male tee and I went to the female tee and yeah. they did their thing. And then when it was my turn to go, they started talking and they're all ignoring me oh. and I'm like, ha, oh, whatever. And I'm not a good golfer, but I can definitely like get some distance on the ball. And they were like, oh, wait a second. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Hello. And I get to play from the women's tees when you normally play from the men's tees. And, and, and I can get some some distance on the ball. So quite a few times when I play my ball and, and things change a little bit. But it's very interesting where right off the bat you you know you end up with the same situation where you're just ignoring it's like 
well, there's a reason why I'm here. So I'm really glad that the pros caddy saw your clubs and recognized like, ah, oh, yeah, she might know what she's doing. And that's the thing about playing in a scramble. People are like, oh, I'm not, I, I'm not good. And it's like, no, 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 no. You have an A, B, C, and D player. You're supposed to have it tiered. You're supposed to have people that are good and people that are less good. But the thing is in a scramble, so you're, everybody is going to be the hero at least once, probably more, because there's going to be times when everybody's out of bounds or they mess up or, you know, and you hit more bad shots in a round of golf than you hit good shots, even the pros. And that's the whole thing. It's how you recover. Yeah. You know, it's only one shot. It's only one decision, one mistake, but it's how you recover. It's not the whole round, a mistake. It, you know, it doesn't define your life or your career. It's one thing and it's how you recover. And right. that's the whole thing. You play shots, you play strategic, you know, just in, 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 in life and in business, it's the same thing. And you are going to have your opportunity to shine. You are going to save the day probably more than once, but at least once. And you are on a team for five hours with people that you wouldn't get a meeting with. And you learn a lot about people when you play golf with them, Plato said, you learn more about people in an hour of conversation than in an hour of, you, you learn more about people in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. You get to know if they cheat, if they lose their cool, if they can laugh at themselves, you know, you, you learn how people are when they, when they oh, play yeah. golf. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, the, it well, golf or that. any game, like, I mean, just playing yeah. a board game with someone yes. for an hour is going to tell you so much about them. And for like, I, I <laughs> it's been five hours since I played golf, but if I am going to play golf, I'd much rather play in a scramble because yeah. of everything that you just said. And, yes. and playing because playing your own a full round of golf by, your, by yourself definitely takes a lot more time. and. It's much exhausting. It's draining. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not an easy sport. Playing a scramble is a great opportunity, like you said, to you know you mess up. That's okay because you have other teammates and you get to shine. And it's a great way of of playing golf. So go to the drive in. At least learn yeah. to hit the golf ball, and then find yourself four or five people and yeah, go play a scramble around the scramble. And ideally. I mean, I love what you said at the beginning, as far as what you learned from life, from the game of golf and being on the course and the people that you've, you've got to meet. And so with your dad, did he hear about the game and talk to you afterwards? Um, yeah, I, I called him afterwards and I, I, I let him know, um, I sunk a 60 foot putt, which was like amazing. And he just, he laughed cause he'd always try to make me practice putting cause I, didn't want to. And um, he's like, you what? And I'm like, yeah, I sunk a 60 foot putt, you know? So I, yeah, we, we talked about it. And, um, you know, I was, I, I, I was hurt that, that he wasn't there, but, you know, I mean, he, he said, I can't just cancel my day at the last minute. And yeah. I was like, okay. You know, so I, I might've been more nervous actually, if he was there, but nobody knew my swing and nobody could just like, he could say one thing and it'd be like, boom, that's it. You know, yeah, he'd one thing and I knew, and I knew what to do, but he also taught us because he couldn't give us lessons all the time to um, look at our shadow, to see what we were doing wrong in our swing. If we couldn't feel it, we could see it. And we would know how to correct because everybody has their own certain things that they typically do wrong and you know once you've done it wrong enough you know how to fix it so well it definitely sounds like he was with you he was in your mind and he was in all those years of training and all those years of being on the well, side and about. screaming over <laughs> how to fix <laughs> your swing and students going yeah slow down get your yeah. behind the ball so do you still play now um you know it's it's either time or money and I actually back up to a golf course, but I haven't played for several years, not since we scattered my dad's ashes. And it's just because of time and money, but I, I will definitely get back to playing again. And I still have my Wilson staff blades. Oh. And I think that I'll just regrip those because 
I like them. Yeah. Why? <laughs> if it's not broken, right? No. <laughs> Why fix it if it's not broken? I can't and, play the oversized clubs. And I there's just, also yeah. the great memories of using those 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 clubs, and you know, they're they're you. They're mine. Every every oh. Uh, nicks on the clubs from playing out at Nellis Air Force Base and and going into the off the off the fairway into the the desert and you know when you go to swing and then you hit a rock and then it takes a little ding out of your club I mean just stuff like that is just yeah well once once the golf course start reopening and oh, it's a great way to reconnect with with clients and then you know find ways to maybe teach and mentor some younger uh, generations to learn how to golf and the the great life lessons of what can be learned on the golf course and how to network on the golf course and do yeah. all those great things yeah, play in charity tournaments. That's what I always recommend to clients because one of the things that I do is help companies get involved with the community because it it builds relationships, yeah. you know? And um, so playing in charity tournaments is something that I definitely recommend. And I've helped um, friends. I don't, I don't want to, you know, teach golf. I can, I can help people a little bit and I'll help friends and maybe their kids if they want, you know, give them little lessons here and there. But um, yeah, and I wrote a blog about lessons learned from the links and um, it ended up being a contribution to a book. And then he did a podcast about it, about networking on the golf course and that kind of stuff. So that was fun. And, you know, maybe I'll expand the blog and do a little small book maybe and expand it a little bit, but I don't know. It's easier to write for other people than to write for yourself. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, sometimes it's a matter of switching the mindset and getting it done. Yeah, yeah, I know. So. And wine. Yeah, wine helps. <laughs> All right. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story. And you can just tell just how much it's meant to you. So I appreciate you sharing it with us. Let's switch over and play the first time lightning oh. round. So the way this works is I'm going to give you 10 different first time options. If there are things you've done before, then it's, if you're on the app, you would say up. So just say up, done it before. If it's something you've never done, not interested, we go left. And if something you've never done would like to do, then we go right. Ready? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Forget up, down, and right. Ride in go-karts. Done it. Done I it. So that's an up. Oh, yeah. I beat everybody. <laughs> do, you, do you remember your first time in go-karts? No, I, I don't remember my first time. All I remember is I would not um, let off the brake. And the I, would the go, brake or I, I would not I would not let off the gas. I'm sorry. I would not put on the brake and let off the gas. Just like the old um, golf carts, they didn't automatically slow down. They were, they were gas powered, not electric. And they just like went, um, yeah, I just, I didn't let up and I just like, and just the whole time full throttle. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Go bird watching. Mm. Nah. Not just bird watching. I'll watch them when I'm outside, but no, no. Okay. Buy a painting. Yes. What's the first painting you bought? The, oh my gosh. Um, when I bought my house in 95, I, did, I wasn't sure like different things that I wanted on the walls and stuff. And um, all of a sudden I never thought about, um, I never thought about it much. And then uh, all of a sudden it was like Picasso cubism because it makes you look at things from different perspectives. So it was at an auction and it was a Picasso lithograph and yeah, it's like three goats playing a flute. In, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> you knew that. That's what you wanted. Right. All right. <laughs> Ever fired someone? Yes. Yes. Volunteer for the Red Cross? Not the Red Cross, but a lot of charities I've done. I've volunteered and been on boards and volunteered a lot. Okay. Go on an Alaskan cruise. No, I want to. I've been on a cruise to the, um, you know, Cabo, 
that that cruise, but not not the Alaskan cruise. So that's no. a right. That's add oh, to the list. Yeah, that's on the bucket list. Take well, we call it the 365 first challenge list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like I don't like bucket lists. I, I am against bucket lists because they're focus on what to do before dying and they're oh, not so i'm all about maximizing what you get out of living like what you can do today that you've never done to Remember. maximize change and improve your life yes take an uber or a lyft yes do you remember your first one uh, i think it was only one i was on a business trip and that's just how we got from the place that the conference was to where we were going to go eat and it was just okay you know, so somebody fun. else ordered it on their their yeah. app okay yeah. uh play handball i would okay so that's all right swing on a tire oh yes tire swing yep yes. play the saxophone i love jazz saxophone. I've played my brother's trumpet. I taught myself how to play guitar because I wanted to play Stairway to Heaven. Oh, I, I suck. I will never play in front of people. Um, I have friends that play the saxophone. I don't know if they let me play it. I'd rather listen to it. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's fair enough. But it sounds like it still sounds like given the opportunity, you would give it a try. If somebody was like, oh, Hey, do you want to try this? I'll yeah. teach you some notes that you would that you'd be up for it. So, oh, yeah, I would. Yeah. So in the moment, you would do it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So next question is today's first time story prompt. And the prompt is first visit to a war memorial in honor of Memorial Day. Oh, my gosh. I went to go visit a friend who I'd grown up with and her husband at the time was in the FBI in hostage rescue. And she was in Virginia, which was right next to DC. And we went to the wall. Uh, that was so, yeah, I know it's like, uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I was born in 65. So by the time the war ended, I, I didn't understand it. I was too little. Um, it's powerful. Yeah. Can, yeah, you can just feel it. Yeah, my, yeah, my first. So when I was a second lieutenant going through the basic school, I it's at Quantico. So took the, yeah. the trip to Washington, D.C. and went to the war memorials. And it's extremely... It was very sombering. It's very powerful, and when you're an act, yeah, when you're an active duty member, it's the mixture of being grateful for the sacrifice that they've made. You've learned the wars. You've learned everything that has gone into fighting those wars through your training, but then it's also honoring their memory and your service that your service honors them. And now, as a veteran, and you know, it's honoring what they fought for and what they died for. I think it's really great that people, you know, honor their sacrifice, but you should be living your life that makes their sacrifice I worth it. Yeah. And I think today, the way that things are today in America, everyone needs to take today to remember that, you know, what they paid the ultimate sacrifice for, for what this country you know, stands for, and that we need to ensure that we, we honor that through living our lives the right way. Yes. Thank you for your service. I mean, I, you're welcome. I, I, yeah. I I've heard, I've heard some, some stories. Yeah. So I, I it's, uh, yeah. Freedom isn't free and yeah. that people don't realize that, you know, they, they don't understand yeah. but yeah, it was just to go see it and then to see you know all the crosses on the on the graves and it, it, it's a feeling and it's just overwhelming and you just spun i i just spontaneously started crying yeah that's uh it's very it's very powerful and mm -hmm. they've added more memorials since then but yeah visiting all those memorials there it's it's incredible so if you oh. haven't been I definitely recommend for people to, to, to go. And I've been, 
blessed to travel the world and to visit memorials of other countries and you know every every time you find yourself at a war memorial you can't help but feel the the weight of that location and that significance mm-hmm. yeah all right so last question is how have you been making the best out of the current situation with the pandemic Oh my goodness. Well, I've worked from home since I started my company in 2002. So that's not different. I live alone. I work from home, but it's different because everything's online now. Um, You know, the networking, the, I work alone and I love it and I love the flexibility, but to not go to a networking group, I miss hugs from people. Um, that, that kind of connection, I can still go on my walks and, you know, you see people and, you know, every once in a while you go to the grocery store, you get something delivered, but, um, it's different and I'm, I'm used to working from home. So that wasn't like a disruption for me. And I actually have been busy because I launched an online course and I had to get a new computer. So that, you know, all the fun of that with the upgrades and the transfers and the, you know, um, and my tech guy works in in Oregon so I'm used to doing that virtually too so it's the same but it's different it's just different but how have you been max have you been maximizing it in kind of way has it afforded you to do things you had never done before well like I said I've been online course yeah with the online which took a lot more than I thought and it was when I was still on the old computer which was like a 2008 or 2004 MacBook Pro. I mean, I just like, I, I got some help because my computer couldn't do what it needed to do. And, um, but the blogs, I, I started writing blogs again, cause it's, yeah, the writer doesn't write for herself, but the blogs that I wrote were more about, um, how I've used stories to cope in situations. Like if I didn't like where I was, I would imagine, you know, use your imagination to get there and make sure that you're telling the right story and the stories that we tell ourselves, how they're twisted and how to unwind them. And um, I even wrote one about working from home and how all the experts that don't work from home are the ones who tell you that you have to get dressed and you have to do this and you have to do that. And I threw that stuff out the window right when I started working from home because you make it work for you and afford the flexibility. You have to get everything that I do is dictated by deadlines and you have to meet the deadlines, but you get to decide how that works for you. Yeah. I don't have to put on a a suit. You know, I can stay in pajamas all day if I want. And I am just as productive as, you know, But you got to figure out what works for you. And that's the whole thing is it is not a one size fits all. And if you have to get up and get dressed, then do that. But I work from all over my house. I don't have like an office, you know. So that's the kind of things that um, that I did different was I would the blogs would be more about the stories we tell ourselves and how to unwrap them and 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 how to cope with things, because I've always done that. All right. So, well, it sounds like it was a great opportunity for, to, for you to share more of your experience because that's an environment that, again, since 2002, you've been yeah. in. And <laughs> I completely agree with what you said. It's ultimately, it's figuring out what works for you. And you can't, it's not about recreating the outside inside of your home. It's not just like homeschooling and everything else. It's not like creating a classroom. It's not like recreating your work office. It's not to some of it, you need to have the tools and the ability to do your work, but it's a, it's a way to step outside of the box and figure out, oh, well, I can still get it done this way, but it's not, it's not the same it's not the same way. It's a way that fits more who I am. And I think if anything, you know, learn to embrace exploring what works for you. And that that's the, the pandemic affords everyone the opportunity to do that, to be creative, step, step outside the box, oh, explore, discover. So splendid. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story and your wisdom with us. Thank you, Anne. I 
I, I love the opportunity to share my story. And again, thank you for your service. Thank you.